What's up, guys? I'm Iris Shell, and this is Too Deep. This is part three of our Water of the Cherubim series. In our previous videos, we went into detail explaining that the cherubim are living creatures, specifically a type of beast of the field. Now, they have four faces and four wings, and this is why they aren't the same beings as the four living creatures of Revelation. Their four faces are that of a man, a lion, ox, and eagle, and they have the likeness of man because of their connection to mankind. This is also why they have the face of man. Now, when they're sculpted in the, in the mercy seat, which is on the Ark of the Covenant, their face of man was facing the high priest, acting as a buffer, if you will, because of their connection to mankind. Now, the cherubim have the face of an eagle because that is their connection to God. They have the face of an ox because they are angels. They're ministering spirits. They enter the presence and glory of God, which is why their likeness is like that of burning coals and torches. And they dart to and fro like lightning because they go between heaven and earth bringing messages from God to man, which is a part of being a ministering spirit. Now, their purpose is to win souls for Christ, as is every angel's purpose. So if you haven't watched those two videos yet, I would go check those out first, as they are the foundation of this video. So, in our last video, we left off by saying that there is no longer a barrier between God and man, but it is still up to angels, the messengers of God, which include spiritual beings and regular humans, to spread the gospel and minister. Now, Paul put it like this, Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 15, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Unless someone tells them, unless someone spreads the gospel, people can't come to Christ. This is why the cherubim's feet are described as this. In Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 7, it says, Their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Now, if I'm being honest, I was stuck on this for a few days. Well, several days if if we're gonna be real several days but i believe that the lord finally revealed it to me the soles of the feet represent the resting place of someone here's here's what i'm talking about ezekiel chapter 43 verse 6 through 7 says while the man was standing beside me i heard one speaking to me out of the temple and he said to me son of man this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where i will dwell in the midst of the people of israel forever as well as Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 24. It says, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon, and from the river, the river Euphrates, to the western sea. The soles of one's feet specifically represents the resting place of that person. So why did the cherubim have the sole of a calf's foot? What's so special about that? Why, why a calf's? right well i believe that this is con- this is in connection to their ox face which is the harvest or winning of souls so let's take a quick look at isaiah chapter 27 verse 9 through 10 therefore by this the guilt of jacob will be atoned for and this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin When he makes all the stones of the altars like chalk stones crushed to pieces, no ashram or incense altars will remain standing. For the fortified city is solitary, a habitation deserted and forsaken. Like the wilderness, there the calf grazes. There it lies down and strips its branches. God said he would forgive the sin of Jacob when they remove the sin from within them. The sin of the Jews, right? Then the city would be alone, deserted, and abandoned like the desert. There the calf grazes, lies down, and strips its branches. That word there, grazes, is the Hebrew word yire, which means to tend a flock, pasture it, to graze it, to rule it, to associate with. So the calf's home, then, would be the fortified city, Jerusalem. Then Isaiah continues to write that the calf won't just graze, it won't just associate with, It won't just minister, but it will also strip its branches. Why? Look at what Jesus says about the times 
to come. John chapter 15, verse 1 through 6, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is it that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. What does that have to do with the cherubim? Well, just stay with me for a second. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. All right. Jesus recorded in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30. He tells the parable of the of the weeds. And it says he put another parable before them, saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no less than gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest and the harvest time. I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. So let's skip down to the explanation Jesus gives to his disciples, verses 36 through 40. It says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the, the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. In our previous video, we explained that these cherubim are angels, ministering spirits. According to Jesus, the angels will separate the weeds from the wheat. This is exactly what Isaiah chapter 27 verse 9 through 11, which we read earlier, says the calf will do. Let's read that one more time. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 10, it says, There the calf grazes, there it lies down and strips its branches. The cherubim soles of their feet are like the soles of a calf's foot because they are angels who will separate the sheep from the goats, the weeds from the wheat, the fruitful branches from the withered branches at the end of the age. Now, the next thing Ezekiel sees according to Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 7, which we read earlier, is that their feet were shimmering like burnished bronze. This is similar to the description of Jesus' feet in Revelation. Revelation chapter 2 verse 18, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God who has, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I've seen many people try to use this verse to prove whether Jesus is white or black. But they fail to realize that Jesus specifically says that his feet are like burnished bronze in this verse. Nothing else. They also fail to realize that burnished bronze isn't white or black. It's bronze. A brown gold, if you will. But that's besides the point. I don't, I don't think this has anything to do with Jesus' skin color. Or it would have been his whole body. And it wouldn't have been at this point in time when he's defining his spiritual attributes. I believe that Jesus was explaining the redemption that comes with accepting the gospel of Christ, which, if you remember, is the armor to cover the soles of our feet, according to which, if you remember, is the armor to cover the soles of our feet, according to Ephesians chapter six, verse 15. And you can check out our video on the armor of God, which is under our nuggets of truth category. Now, back to what I was saying, right? His feet are burnished bronze because bronze represents redemption, healing, salvation, etc. for anyone willing to accept it. So here's some examples of bronze being for everyone. The representation of bronze being for everyone. So 
When the people of Israel were bitten by the fiery serpents, the seraphim, in the wilderness because of their disobedience, only looking up at that bronze fiery serpent, that bronze fiery seraphim that Moses had, that Moses had um, beaten out and made and put on a pole, only looking up at that would heal them according to Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 through 9. Now, Jesus then likened the bronze fiery serpent to himself. John chapter 3, verse 14 through 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may, may have eternal life. Jesus uses the analogy of the bronze fiery serpent that Moses had made and, and lifted it up on the pole for all who were bitten, for anyone that was that wanted to be saved anyone that wanted healing all they had to do was look up he used that analogy for his his redemption that he was bringing he used this analogy to lead up to the most infamous verse in all of the bible he he used it to explain that salvation is for anyone who's willing to receive it anyone willing to just look up and accept it john 3:16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In the law, which as we said in previous videos, is a foreshadowing of the good things to come, the gospel, the coming redemption and salvation of Jesus. Now with that said, the high priest had to bring a burnt offering for himself first on the bronze altar in the tent of meeting before he could go behind the curtain to the golden altar of incense in the Holy of Holies. In fact, everyone was expected to bring their sacrifice on this bronze altar in the tent of meeting before the Lord, which we can see in Leviticus chapter 1. But they not but not everyone could go into the Holy of Holies. The high priest could only go in once a year and he had to make sure that he was fully cleansed. He he did all of these pre-rituals before he could enter into the Holy of Holies to this gold altar. Whereas the tent of meeting with the bronze altar, anyone and everyone was welcome. They were expected to go to it, just like we are expected to go and look up to Jesus to accept his salvation. So bronze, it represents that it's for everybody. That this redemption, this salvation, it's for everyone. Now look what Jesus says about the feet. Matthew chapter 10, verse 13 through 15. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be, be- it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah then for that town jesus said to shake the dust from your feet if someone rejects the gospel that you bring to them shaking off the dust from your feet was a form of rejection while the washing of one's feet was a sign of acceptance but we're not gonna get too deep into the symbolic meaning of feet for the sake of time that could take that would take a while so let's try to work this back to the cherubim shall we the cherubim's feet are described in the same way that jesus's feet were described as being burnished bronze and we see this in ezekiel chapter 1 verse 7 now i believe that this has to do with them being ministering spirits being angels whether someone accepts you ministering to them whether they have faith this is the importance of the burnished bronze feet it's what the cherubim can do for those who believe Look at what Peter says, Acts chapter 3, verse 6 through 7. It says, But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. I believe this is the same idea here with the cherubim because they are ministering spirits. They have the authority to heal as they lead others to Christ so that they have the full redemption of Christ, the full redemption and salvation and healing in Christ Jesus, as we stated in our previous video. Now, this this leads us to their hands. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 8. 
Under their wings on their four sides, they had human hands. Now, to me, since it says under their wings on their four sides, they had human hands, to me it sounds like they only had four hands, but we can't be 100% sure. But that's kind of where my mind's going right now, since it says under their wings, and they only have four wings. So, anyways, but they didn't have just any type of hands, though. They, they specifically had human hands, and I believe that this relates back to the whole human likeness, their connection to mankind, their connection to humanity. Now, with that said, hands represent the passing on of one spirit. Here's what I mean. Whenever the hand of the Lord was upon someone, something miraculous happened. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. Ezekiel was physically teleported. His spirit wasn't just caught up somewhere else like we see John specifying in Revelation. His whole physical body moved. This is a spiritual gift, if you will, given by the Spirit of God. For more on teleportation in the Bible, check out our video, Does the Bible Support Teleportation?, which is under our Too Deep category. Now, this is similar to when Philip was physically teleported after baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, which is recorded in Acts chapter 8, verse 39 through 40. This isn't the only miracle or spiritual gift bestowed when the hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel either. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 1 through 3. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Kabar Canal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Kabar Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. The hand of the Lord bestowed spiritual gifts upon those whom his hand laid upon. They received the Holy Spirit. They received his spirit for as long as the hand of the Lord was upon them. The New Testament confirms this as well. Take a look at Acts chapter 8, verse 17 through 19. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on, wh on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. When the apostles laid their hands on people, they received the Holy Spirit that was in them. But the laying on of hands isn't just for receiving the Spirit of God. It's not just the passing of this of spiritual gifts from one to another the laying on of hands bestows whatever spirit is in that person onto the person that they put their hands on for instance look at paul's writing to timothy in his first letter first timothy chapter 5 verse 22 do not be hasty in the laying on of hands nor take part in the sins of others, keep yourself pure. Paul seems to link the laying on of hands to taking part in whatever someone else is doing, taking on their spirit. So it doesn't matter if it's good or bad because in his first and second letter, he says that Timothy's spiritual gift was inquired through the laying on of hands by the elders. And we see this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. And we see this foreshadowed in the law. Look with me at Leviticus chapter 16, verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. Aaron had to lay his hands on the goat so that the sins of the people, of all the people of Israel, would go on to that goat. The laying on of hands transfers whatever spirit is in that person to the other person that they are laying hands upon. So, could this be the reason that the cherubim have human hands? Because they have the authority and the power to pass on the spirit of God onto others, which we already which we already went into that they have. So, could this not be the same thing? Here's an example of, of angels spiritually empowering or restoring someone. 
Luke chapter 22, verse 43 through 44. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, some will say, well, that was Jesus. He doesn't really count. He's God, right? Sure, he's God. But at the, at the time, he had emptied himself out and he set aside his godliness and was working only as man, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 through 8. But that's fine. I, I, I want to bring to your remembrance what the author of the book of Hebrews says about angels. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. According to the author of the book of Hebrews, the purpose of angels is to minister to all who are to inherit salvation. They build up the spirit of the people of God. They go out and spread the gospel to the unbeliever. They minister so that they might harvest as many souls as possible. So in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah saw the Lord seated on his throne with the seraphim flying around crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He cried out, woe is me because of his uncleanness. Look what happens after that. After he cries out, woe is me. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 6 through 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The only way this seraph could do that is if he was a ministering spirit, if he was an angel. The seraph cleansed Isaiah's guilt and sin by touching his tongue with a burning coal that he had in his hands from the altar. So even though the author of Hebrews doesn't directly say that the angels will lay their hands on people and they will be healed or that they will lay their hands on people and they will be saved, that doesn't mean that that's not what he was saying because uh, let's read that one more time. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Is healing not the children's bread? Is healing not for those who are to inherit salvation? So if they are sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation, wouldn't it make sense that they also heal? That they also bring physical and mental healing, emotional healing? That they also are able to pass on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that they are also able to lay their hands on people and they receive the Holy Spirit as we see human angels do. Would not spiritual angels be able to do the same thing? So just to sum everything up for you guys, the cherubim soles of their feet are like the soles of a calf's foot because they are angels who will separate the sheep from the goats, the weeds from the wheat, the the fruitful branches from the withered branches at the end of the age. They have bronze feet because they are ministering spirits. They have the authority to heal as well as lead others to Christ so that they have full redemption in Christ Jesus, as we stated in our previous video. They have human hands because they can bestow the spirit of God and the gifts of God and the healing of God upon those whom they lay hands on as all angels, both spiritual beings and human beings can. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and that it answered a few more of your questions on the cherubim and especially questions that you may have had about their hands and their feet. And if you feel that maybe we left something out or maybe we didn't explain everything as well as we could have, let us know in the comment section below. And if you had any questions that we didn't answer pertaining to the specific topic of the cherubim and their hands and the feet that we discussed in this video, let us know in the comment section below. But if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.